It's all right. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And um, we're going to pick up here uh, in verse 15. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 15. And um, Paul here talking about the law and the proper place for it. Uh, and uh, how that the fulfilling of the law is n- not the proper place when it comes to salvation. Galatians 2 and 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Does that bother you? I'm telling you, I, when I uh, read that verse, I was reminded uh, about the sensitive nature of our society at this moment. And some people would read that statement and be highly offended. Uh, you know the way to fix that, don't you? Get saved. Amen. (laughs) That's how you do that. Uh, He says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's the solid message all the way through the... uh, New Testament. Matter of fact, uh, from uh, the uh, chronology of writing, if you will, Galatians, one of the first books of the New Testament that was written. And so f- from the very beginning there, uh, we are reminded, of course, that justification doesn't come by the works of the law. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed... I make myself a transgressor, for I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law then Christ is dead in vain. Lord, we pray that you'll help us as we consider uh, some truths here from uh, this section of Scripture that we might be encouraged uh, in our life and testimony in you. And, uh, Father, that it might, uh, that that encouragement would demonstrate itself uh, in a witness that, uh, that brings others to Christ. Please bless our hearts with your word as we open them to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This was the testimony of the Apostle Paul, I do not frustrate the grace of God, in verse 21. And what he's talking about there is that, uh, you know, the frustration of the grace of God would be to turn to some type of works uh, for salvation. Uh, And uh, Paul said, I'm not, I I, I didn't do that, I'm not going to do that. Uh, And of course, um, we have the great message of salvation by grace through faith as revealed to us by him, and, and especially and powerfully in the book of Romans. Uh, But um, uh, he speaks to us here about the testimony of his life uh, uh, from the moment, if you will, of salvation. And I want us to focus on that very familiar and encouraging verse in verse 20, where he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Now, I know when many of you read that verse, it equates to some degree to other passages of Scripture in its impact, in, its, uh, in our sentiment for it, in our love for it, uh, to other passages of Scripture, maybe even like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, and various other passages. John 3.16, of course, for God so loved the world. This is one of the great passages of the New Testament. Uh, And uh, it's a lot like, um, uh, I remember preaching on uh, uh, Psalm 23 one time and uh, reading through some of the various commentaries and books and all that kind of thing. And and, um, one of the uh, the commentators said, you know, uh, trying to to preach through the 23rd Psalm is like taking a beautiful rose and plucking every petal off of it. By the time you get done with it, it seems as though something's lost uh, from, from it, not because anything is lost from the Word, but because of our ability to grasp the depth uh, of, the, of the Word of God. 
Uh, and that's the way I feel about Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Uh, Paul's testimony is this verse, of course, as uh, is clear uh, there, mentioning I and me several times. Uh, and so talking about uh, the, the attitude of his heart, the state of his heart, the state of his life. Uh, and uh, that, that this verse uh, that we often read and quote, the life that I now live, I live uh, by the faith of the Son of God. Uh, it's a verse that draws people to the blessedness of the knowledge of Christ as Savior and encourages people to know the Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That comes out of this uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And it's rightly so because as believers... Our life should have a touch of heaven about it, a, a glory, a wonder, a sweetness, uh, a resonance of spiritual things. That should be the testimony of our life, an otherworldly life in this present world. That's Galatians 2 and 20. Somebody has described the verse as a star of high magnitude for the Christian life. It's one that challenges us. It's one that we hope for. Uh, it, it, it's one that we look to for guidance. And yet it is one, uh, as so many other passages of Scripture, it seems that it's difficult to attain the victory of its principles. It is indeed a high magnitude. And uh, uh, as such, as that type of uh, scriptural uh, uh, verse and really declaration Discovering and seeking to apply its truths will help our life have the testimony in the world that Paul's had in this world. Uh, when you think about his life and, and what he went through and how faithful he was and his heart for uh, the gospel, his heart for the Lord, his heart for the churches, and by that I mean especially, of course, the people, uh, it's all described in uh, verse 20. The reasons are all in verse 20 of Galatians 2. This is why Paul lived the way he lived. It's why he was the way that he was. Uh, and so uh, it's often been said that some people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. Uh, but in reality, our heavenly mind uh, is that that allows us to have the greatest earthly influence. And uh, we see this heavenly mind uh, in, and heavenly heart, if you will, uh, in, the, uh, in the testimony, the self-described testimony of the Apostle Paul. What was it that caused him to have that heavenly heart? To have that heavenly testimony uh, in, a, in a dastardly world? What, what was it that caused Paul to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 have the victory that he did in this life? Well, I'll mention several aspects from verse 20. And again, it'll just be really skimming the surface uh, of the depth of this verse, uh, but the fact of the matter is, if we're going to have a, if we're going to have the testimony uh, that Paul had, the joy that Paul had, the faithfulness and determination that Paul had, uh, we're going to have to experience a heavenly mortification. Now you see that in the first part of verse twenty. Look at those first three words: "I am crucified." Now that's past tense. Um, I'll say more about that in just a moment. Uh, so uh, some point. Paul died. He died. And we think about living, we don't think about dying. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, when we study the Bible, we find out we don't even start to live until we die. The Bible tells us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, for instance. Paul said, I am crucified. And uh, he's, remember, he's talking here about the matter of salvation and how one comes to Christ we don't trust the law. The law simply reveals that we're sinners. That's what it was designed to do. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Uh, and so it's not a means of salvation except to demonstrate our sin uh, so that we realize our need of a Savior. So he's talking here about sa uh, his salvation and that salvation, of course, that took place on the Damascus Road. After all of that persecuting of Christians and, and striving to stamp out the name and testimony and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord met him there uh, and the sun uh, uh, in, a, in a brightness of light. In noonday, Paul fell off his horse and he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In a moment of time, life by death. He's, Paul said, I am crucified. You know, when you and I were 
saved. We, we, the Bible talks about us either be, uh, 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 having, uh, being in Christ or not in Christ. The moment we receive Jesus as Savior, we are in Christ. And the, and the Bible, by God's own design, tells us that once we are in Christ, uh, we are in Him, in a sense, eternally. Uh, here's what I'm driving at. We were in Christ on the, on the cross of Calvary. Uh, and uh, now if you want to break your head, just um, meditate on that for a while. But the fact of the matter is, this crucifixion that takes place uh, in us uh, can be uh, traced all the way back to the moment that we trusted Christ as our personal Savior. Uh, that word uh, crucified uh, here, as I mentioned, uh, it is uh, in the perfect tense and the passive voice. And what that means is Paul is literally saying here, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been. And that affects uh, every um, uh, uh, time frame of his being. I am crucified with Christ so that it's not just I was, it's not just I will be, but I am. A state that, uh, an event that took place in me that continues to be in me and will continue to be in me. I am crucified with Christ. That's why the Bible says, by the way, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, notice this here. Uh, our salvation uh, should mark the end of our old, regenerate, uh, unregenerate self. Our old, unregenerate self. The sinful I should be crucified and have no more claim on our life. Paul said, I am crucified. And indeed, the Bible tells us in Romans 6 and verse number 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, a whole lot of our problems would be solved if we just died. That's right. Be mortified. I am, I am crucified with Christ. Why did the Lord, why did our Lord, uh, uh, you know, accomplish what he accomplished? Because he was completely submitted to the will of, of the Father over and over again. Right down to his preaching, he said, listen, uh, the, things that I, the things that I tell you, they're not my own. They come from God the Father. And in the Garden of, uh, the garden of uh, Gethsemane, while he prayed uh, with that great intensity, he said, uh, uh, you know, if this cup pass from me, nevertheless, uh, uh, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Think about this. Uh, in a sense, he was crucified before he was ever crucified. He gave himself completely to the accomplishment of the will of God, no matter what it might have. And that's what Paul did, was saying here, I am crucified. Again, a lot of our problem is because we're just too much alive. Uh, we're, we're not dead enough yet. And uh, if, if, so you think about this. We read across the, uh, in Romans chapter number 8. And the Bible talks to us about how that God is working to, the, to conform us to the image of his son. Well, look, that, that confirmation comes by way of death. Death. And we find a lot of frustration and difficulty. Uh, uh, and I mean frustration, really, uh, in life. Because we're still selfishly uh, not mortified. And God is going to continue to work in us <laughs> to kill us. Lord, you're killing me. Exactly. And when we get where you're good and dead, then we can do something with you. Now, the Lord taught this when he said, except a seed fall into the ground and die, it's not going to produce anything. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. And that's the point. Uh, we don't even begin to become fruitful until we're dead to self and alive unto God. And so if we're going to have uh, that kind of testimony and power and productivity on our Christian life that we need to have, we're going to have to experience this heavenly mortification. 
The second aspect of Paul's life that made his uh, testimony what it was is not only uh, a heavenly uh, mortif- uh, mort- mortification, but then also a heavenly identification. Look at this. I am crucified, not with, for no good purpose or just because it was uh, fun to do or it was an event in my life. I am crucified with Christ. We identify with him. Matter of fact, we can go further and say that he is our identity. A lot of people struggle in life at various stages in life, and it's because they're fighting for some uh, reputation. They're fighting for some uh, you know, recognition among men. They're trying to be identified as some special entity or whatever it may be. Look, this is one of the reasons why uh, you know, social media has had such a, uh, a huge uh, impact in the world now because everybody is trying to put themselves out there. And it's a mess. And uh, now they're fighting on Capitol Hill over TikTok and all that other kind of thing. Uh, and uh, 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 <laughs> bans on TikTok and whatever you might think about the First Amendment and all. There's some of us that never got on it in the first place. You know, uh, and I don't know what will come of it. But the fact of the matter is a lot of times it's just the promotion of self. It's the promotion uh, of, uh, of me. It is a reputation that I'm trying to present to the world. And the problem is this. Uh, uh, you know, the problem is this, that uh, now uh, social media is so prolific. I, I mean, you, you almost have to have... Uh, it's almost impossible now to get out there. You're just an, another, not even a drop in the bucket of all of the racket on the internet uh, because of others clamoring to uh, demonstrate their identity in the world. It really is. I've thought that way about our church. And uh, you know how we try to advertise there and let people know in the calamity of it all, there's still Jesus Christ. Amen. And, uh, but really, how do you get out there? Um, uh, and in some ways, really, listen, we, we shouldn't. If, we're, if it's all about the, and I'm not talking about the church, I'm talking about us as individuals. If, we, if we're just trying to promote uh, me, I, uh, uh, instead of Christ, really, it, you know, think about that for a minute. Uh, Paul, went to the, Paul went to Corinth and he said, I was determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Here's the point. Uh, he is, the Bible says, our wisdom. He is our strength. Our identity should be Christ. And so Paul says, I, I am crucified with him. Of course, that's a direct reference to what I said a moment ago about how that we were in Christ on the cross if we've trusted uh, him as Savior. But there are a lot of ways in which we identify with our Savior. We identify with him in our functions in the world. There are several of those. Uh, one would be as a soldier. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I, I still like the idea uh, that the, uh, of the Lord's army. You know. And, and uh, we're living in a day of, of kind of softness. And oh, uh, really, when you think about it, that seems kind of crazy too. Because if you look at, uh, we've already mentioned about these college campuses, that's not soft at all. I mean, there's anger and meanness and, you know, vitriol coming out there. Uh, but what I mean is everybody is perpetually offended. You know, every, uh, and uh, anything, you can't even call somebody by their name now. And I want to encourage you to get by and read Davin's shirt tonight. It's birthday, 40th birthday. Check his shirt out. Uh, <laughs> Now his face is red. Red is that for you? Uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, the idea here that, uh, that, that we have to, uh, for some reason, uh, throw away Bible illusions. Uh, he calls us a soldier of Jesus Christ. And uh, we, that's part of our function. Um, Paul said in 2 Timothy 2 and 4, No man that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We identify with our Lord by being faithful in our function as a soldier, by being faithful in our function as servants. Our Savior was a servant. I was talking earlier uh, this week to someone about 
uh, how that uh, Jesus uh, girded a towel and washed the disciples' feet. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were talking about that in Sunday school, weren't we? Because uh, we were talking about, uh, we're going through a series there on Baptist distinctives. And uh, um, uh, one of those are the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So uh, I brought up the question, why isn't foot washing a church ordinance? Why, you know, there are some churches that practice it here and there, uh, but why is it not? Well, uh, the, the, the simple answer is that you don't see it practiced by the churches. You see an instruction uh, or an example of the Lord. He said, uh, you know, as you've seen me do uh, to you, do to others. But then there's not any further instruction on it in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament like there is with baptism and the Lord's table. And we don't read the churches doing that uh, like we do baptism and the Lord's table. Well, uh, you know... Uh, long story short, Jesus identified himself as a servant. And if we're going to be identified with Christ, we're going to have to be the same. Not being served, but serving. Uh, Paul said in Romans 16, 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and, uh, with, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Uh, again, in Colossians 3 and 24, Knowing that of the Lord ye have received the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. We identify with him, and when we're faithful uh, soldiers, we identify with him when we're faithful servants, and then we identify with him when we're faithful saints. You know, we should glory in the truth as Paul did uh, of First uh, John chapter three, uh, uh, chapter three and verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. You wonder why the world can't uh, get with you and you can't get with them? Because uh, you're, if you're saved, you're a child of God. That's why. In John 1 and 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And so as far as our sainthood is concerned, we identify with the Lord in our functions, but we also identify with the Lord in our fellowship. That word with Christ. I'm reminded of the hymn, you know, I come to the garden alone in the garden. Uh, and uh, he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There's this fellowship with uh, the Lord. And we identify with him by this fellowship. Interestingly, the, uh, the hymnist said there, uh, you know, none other has, has ever known, but they do know. Uh, just like Moses' time with God was reflected on his face in front of the people. Uh, and the same uh, we could say with James, or rather Stephen, in Acts 6 and verse 15. The Bible says, as they were stoning him and getting ready to kill him, uh, all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Why? The presence of the Lord on our countenance. It's a reflection of our fellowship with him. Uh, the demeanor that we have is a reflection of our fellowship with him. James chapter 3 speaks of that in verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, uh, then uh, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness shall be sown in peace of them that make peace. And uh, our fellowship with God, and specifically with the Lord Jesus Christ, should produce a peace in our life that's evident for others to see. And so Paul had this heavenly mortification. He had a heavenly identification. And then it, uh, I put this down, uh, heavenly animation. Uh, in uh, verse number, uh, first part of verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yes. I live. Matter of fact, as I said before, I hadn't even started living until I'm dead. Until I'm crucified in him. And he goes on to say here, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It is a, it is a, a, a life, yes, eternal life, uh, but such a life uh, as to allow us to... Uh, uh, live, as the Savior said, more abundantly. I live. I've told you before, there are, too many, there are too many believers 
uh, you know, who uh, give the appearance that they've been uh, baptized in vinegar. Where is the life in Christ? The light of that countenance. Um, uh, and, uh, the, you know, you read through the New Testament and you find the Lord's interactions with people, and those who believed on him, uh, produced this joy and life in them. And what we've tried to do, uh, and I say we, I mean some aspects of the churches have tried to give the, the appearance of life while they're feeding the flesh. Um, this is one reason why they've changed the music and all that other kind of thing to try to produce uh, a, 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 some type of um, appearance of life. And, you know, you'd have to say, uh, when you watch people sing hymns in a church, you know, some of the people that are the staunchest hymn singers are the most miserable looking ones. I'm sorry about that, but... <laughs> I mean, ain't that right? I mean, you, even the hymns we sang tonight, you know, victory and Jesus and glory to the Lord and all the other kind, that should produce a joy in it. Well, to sing like there's something in that. Well, we ought not sing like there's something in it. There is something in it. Amen. Uh, and so, uh, but, but this life we have in him is real life. How do we know? Because... Um, Paul said in Philippians chapter number 2 that before we're saved, we're dead. I mean, we're alive in the world, but we're dead in the spirit. We're, we're dead, but when we get saved, we have life. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. I'm glad for that life. I thought I had life while I was a drunk. I thought I had, a, I thought I had life when I was having such a good time I landed in jail. That's, that wasn't life. True life was found the moment the Lord saved me uh, and forgave sin and gave us a life worth living and joy worth having. It's a heavenly animation. Uh, and uh, just because we're mortified doesn't mean we're dead. As I said, we only start to live. The Lord said in Matthew 10, 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it. But he that loseth, loseth his life for my sake shall find it. We find life in Christ. The Lord didn't die for us so we can go on living like we want to. The Lord died for us so that by faith in him, he can live through us. That's a much better way to live. Amen. Um, in Philippians 1 and 20, Paul said, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but, uh, but uh, that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. Whether it be by life or by death, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And so, do people see that life in us? Do they see it? That joy of the Lord? Uh, uh, um, that representation of what it really means to live because of faith in Christ? That's what they saw in Paul. I mean, how in the world, how in the world do, does a man get in prison for preaching and sing hymns and the angel come break him out? Only by the, 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 the spiritual life of God in him. Amen. Amen. And so there has to be, the, there should be, uh, if we're going to have the testimony and, and productivity of the life of Paul, we're going to have to have a heavenly animation, man. Uh, we've got to be glad we're saved and not just fake, but in reality, thankful that my sins are forgiven. Heaven's my home. The, uh, the, the fourth, the fourth uh, 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 characteristic of a heavenly heart like this is, a, uh, is, of course, a heavenly realization. And you see that down here when he says, uh, uh, the, uh, Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's the animation. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That heavenly realization is this. Mentioned three times in your New Testament, the just shall live by faith. And you know why that's the reason a lot of people are miserable. They don't want to live by faith. Uh, they want to live by what they can control. They, they want to live by what they can do. Uh, but real joy uh, and real heavenly living 
uh, uh, is experienced in our life when we learn to live by faith. I think of the hymn, Trusting Jesus, that is all. For my salvation, for my life itself, uh, I've got to trust the Lord. I have faith in God. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that brings this joy of life. And uh, here's why. If we live just according to what we can do, guess what? We're going to get just according to what we can do. You remember when the Lord came, the, the disciples, he set them out to sail across the sea there, and a storm came up, and, and boy, they were, uh, I, I'm going to say they were wet. And uh, they thought they were going to be sinking. And they thought they were going to be drowning. <laughs> but Jesus came to them in the fourth watch of the night, walking above the storm. Here's the point. If we get to where we just focus on what we're doing, what we can do, and trust in us, and that is all, we're going to be, in a, we're going to be so sorely discouraged in this life. But if we live by faith, our Savior can allow us to walk on the water. Uh, and you, uh, you can't tell me it wasn't a step of faith when, G, uh, when Peter stepped off that boat. Lord, if it's you. Now, hold on a minute. I don't have time for this thought. They were already scared they were going to drown. And, and, G, and Jesus comes along and says, oh, don't be afraid. It's me. Right? And Peter, if it's you, uh, bid me, uh, you know, uh, come unto you on the water. If it's you, you better make sure you're beyond if. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, otherwise, you know, uh, anyway, you get the point, though. Peter, for that moment of time, all the fright uh, removed by faith. Uh, that's the way that they, that, that's heavenly thinking. That's the heavenly realization. Look, for all, the Bible's clear. In that storm, they rode and they pulled and they rode and they pulled and they were getting absolutely nowhere until Jesus came and, and uh, got into the boat with them. And the Bible says immediately they were, they were at the other side. We don't begin to enjoy life until we're walking by faith. As long as we're trying to pull and row on our own, it's just constant toil and misery. And so there must be this heavenly realization that the life I now live, and I love this, in the flesh. That's great. Because we're still here. Amen. I mean, we know it's going to be good in heaven. Everybody's going to be good in heaven. All the problems straightened out. Finally, you know, amen. Hallelujah for that. Uh, but I love the fact that it's mentioned here in the flesh. We can live heavenly in the flesh. We don't have to wait till heaven. We can experience it now if we learn to have faith and trust in him. It, it's, uh, this, of uh, course, faith means a reliance and a dependence upon. And that should be our heart continually. It's not a matter of striving, but it's a matter of trusting. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Paul said. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Where? In this world. In this world. And so there's heavenly realization. And all of that comes because of this last one. Last part of verse 20. Uh, how he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's heavenly salvation. Now why do I mention it that way? Because that kind of life is available for every saved person. Every saved. Do you have salvation? You have Galatians 2 and 20 working in there somewhere. Hmm. Yeah. If you've experienced this uh, forgiveness of sin by faith in His name, you can uh, be crucified with Christ and live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave Himself for you. Well, it doesn't take much for us to look at the world and look at our communities and if you watch the news and whatever and all, I mean, you just see. It's a wreck. It's a wreck. But I'm telling you, Galatians 2.20, living crucified with Christ by faith in Him, 
it takes us and moves us above the fray. Huh? And we have the confidence of Paul, the joy of Paul, the fulfillment of Paul, the fruitfulness of Paul, uh, the, uh, uh, the strength of Paul, uh, if we can uh, understand that, that all of that life is in, because of Christ, every saint of God. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer, please.